just a, a quick introduction. Uh, ben Kenyon, as David just said. How many people were at the TreeNet conference? Just a quick show of hands this year. So we've got pretty much a 50-50 split. So for the people that were at the TreeNet conference, what we're aiming to do is, is expand on that a little. Um, but for the people who weren't at the TreeNet conference, what we're hoping to do today, I guess, is, is change the way we look at, at managing risk and managing trees in an urban environment. And um, particularly with the input from, from Patty and, and from, from James, I think we can get some really, really good ideas happening. So every one of us has probably done a bit of it in the past before. I think we're just trying to formalise it a bit more. And I think there's a lot of people here who have been doing it for quite a while and, and done quite a lot of it. So <coughs> the ideas that we've got are really simple, but what I can see is that the, the possibilities are endless. And I think each one of you, once you start to see what what uh, the work that Patty and now with James are, are, are doing, you'll go, geez, that's so simple. Why haven't we been doing this in the past? And every one of you will end up coming up with ideas on, on how to do it. Um, a really quick background on myself. Um, my grandfather, Ralph Kenyon, uh, was one of the um, uh, founding members of the Bird Observers Club of Victoria and is, uh, is to date still <coughs> the first man to have photographed a live bird in, in uh, full plumage in the wild. Um, one of my earliest memory, memories of dealing with my grandfather is sitting down very, very quietly while he photographed um, n numerous birds either nesting or not nesting and I, all I can remember is making sure that I had to be extremely quiet. Um, Dad, my father, Phil Kenyon, has had a massive influence on both Patty and my life in that um, we both started splitting firewood for our uh, siblings because we had two fires uh, that heated the whole house. Uh, we've learned a lot about trees all the way through, but we've also had a lot to do with the, the bird influence as well from, from Grandpa. So currently I run a small consultancy business in Melbourne and Patty runs a contracting business and the two of us work fairly well together. My background, I'm a zoologist by profession. Um, come from Queensland. I worked initially in fisheries and for the Queensland Museum and then I went overseas um, to Britain and stayed over in Britain for more than 10 years and one of the things that fascinated me when I was in Britain was backyards make up the largest component of habitat in Britain. So my focus to all the wildlife is out there turned to actually cities are a really exciting place for wildlife and it's where people engage with wildlife most. So I came back and started up a company for nature which helps people attract and manage wildlife, particularly in urban and, and peri-urban environments. And we supply, amongst other things, nest boxes. But um, last year at the TreeNet conference where we started talking about a tree is not an island, it is part of a whole ecosystem. And most of the um, biodiversity value across the landscape is actually in the 30 centimetres above and below the soil but then goes all the way to the tops of the trees and we need to stop looking at trees in isolation but how they integrate in the whole um, landscape and Ben is going to talk quite a bit more about that lately, uh, later on today. But what we, I really bring is some measurement, the exact wildlife that uses these and how they integrate across the landscape with the skills that both Ben and Pat are bringing to today. And I guess that's over to Pat. Yep. Um, my background basically came from, as well as Ben, a lot of firewood splitting. Um, I tended to branch off into the tree climbing area and became the Australian tree climbing champion twice and numerous ones in Victoria. And sort of, I'm pretty well stuck to the tree climbing and chainsaw operation side of things. And through the, the habitat or working for councils or contracting to a lot of councils and private properties, we, we tended to chop down lots and lots and lots of trees. And we got to the stage where we thought, well, what, what can we do with these trees rather than chop them down? And with skills as a chainsaw, I think we've come up with a, a really good method. And the more input we get off James, um, the better. But with saving some of these trees rather than call, calling them a risk or a hazard and, and taking them out, and I think we can retain a, a lot more of them and also change their basic, their basic knowledge or style of pruning to, um, to hang on to and retain a lot more structure in some of these trees. And one of the, one of the biggest reasons we, we often get called in is from a risk management point of view. And I think if you look at look at this sugar gum here, the eucalyptus cladocalyx, I'll stick, try and stick with botanical names so we don't get mixed up with, uh, with common names. This eucalyptus cladocalyx, where do they come from? South Australian? North Peninsula? 
York Peninsula, which is the Nana version, I'm pretty sure, but then the main one is in the Flinders Ranges. Um, and Kangaroo, sorry, Kangaroo Island, yeah. Um, so, is this typical for the species, Kim? Yeah. I, from, from the ones that I saw in the Flinders Ranges, I would have thought that this is far more multi-branched than, than what, would, what you would see in their natural environment. Yeah. They branch quite a lot. Um, I do suspect that these have been locked at some stage in the past. And if you have a look at around about, what, two, it's about eight to ten metres on nearly every tree, you'll see that there's a, a fairly decent um, section of branches that, that originate there. There's an old wound over this side if you, if you come around and have a look. And in the next tree back down, you can actually see the old, the old cut through there. Now, I don't, I don't know whether they've actually been locked, but given the decay that's in the trunks there, I suspect that they have been. If you translate this tree into a more higher use park, I would imagine that from a risk management point of view, we would have some issues for, for a number of reasons. Um, branch failure, uh, small branch failure, large limb failure, and in some cases, whole trunk failure. And how often have you seen large trees like this removed from a risk perspective? And I think it is too often, and I think that's probably why we've started to have a change, and that is that from, a, from an arborist point of view, it's a really, really easy decision to make to say this tree is an unmanageable risk in the landscape, it needs to be removed. It's a far more difficult decision to say this tree has issues and I think we can still maintain it in the landscape. And one of the ways we've started to maintain and manage trees like this in a higher use landscape is not by pruning at all, it's by leaving the tree alone and it's by mulching out beyond the drip zone and starting to underplant with other, other, other species. So rather than treating it like an island as it is at the moment, start to get some mulch on the ground, get some small Fabaceae, Mimosaceae, so Acacias, um, what else, Harden Vergias, those sorts of things planted in underneath the Godineas, and all of a sudden the ground environment isn't hard compacted. The roots aren't competing with uh, grass for, for water and nutrients. In fact, you've got mulch, you then get fauna coming, soil fauna coming into the mulch, you'll get worms, you'll get small bugs. And then with the other plants, well, Mimosaceae and Fabaceae both fix nitrogen from the air into the soil. So it's a very, very happy relationship that occurs. And quite quickly, we've discovered that human beings, for some reason, don't like to sit on mulch or walk through plants that are fairly prickly on occasion. So all of a sudden, if you, were to put a, uh, if you were to put this in a high-use park, the tree's still in a high-use park, but it's starting to become part of a plant community rather than an island, and also the risk that is associated with it, people just aren't walking under the places where a branch may fail. And that's proving to be a very successful way of dealing with risk without actually touching the tree, but just improving its conditions. Um, there's been a lot of work done on habitat and uh, and how to maintain it in, the, in a forest environment, but most of it's been done in uh, Northern America and Europe. And I'll yeah, over to James. absolutely. I mean, as a young zoologist, I was told, and I've spoken to a number of people around here, that dead trees are really important and we meet, need to retain them at all costs. And the science of actually looking at animals and how they engage with trees is less than 50 years old. Our understanding of hollows really has come from the northern hemisphere but in particular North America and there we're primarily dealing with pine species. Now pine species because of their very nature tend not to develop hollows until after they're dead and it's either by vertebrate species such as squirrels and woodpeckers that can physically create those hollows in the first place or it's by fungus. Now fungus has a real role to play in our eucalypts as well but the majority 90 percent of our hollow bearing trees in Australia are eucalypts. You get a few other rainforest species and a few mangrove species, but the main species we're relying on for hollows are eucalypts, and they develop relatively early in their lifespan. They probably have hollows in them from maybe 60 to 80 years, but those hollows don't necessarily become available to the wildlife until somewhere between 120 and 150 years old, depending on the species. And if you want large hollows, we're, we may be talking two, three, even 400 years, depending on the species. And what we're looking for, and what these trees offer, because of how uh, Ben was describing their pruning earlier, they have a succession 
of hollow sizes. So a whole variety of species from invertebrates and small bats all the way up through possums and even large cockatoos can start to use them. But going back to where I started from, dead trees are really important. Well, I think that's actually a myth in Australia. And it's live trees like this that offer far greater advantage. And the reason they offer far greater advantage to wildlife is because they modify their environment. They're not just sitting there and create, providing habitat in the environment. There has been some work done just from Arbury Park School, which is a small environmental school up in the hills, um, where they've actually recorded the temperature inside hollows. And on a 35, 40 degree day, the ambient temperature inside a hollow is somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees cooler. So on a 40 degree day, if I'm sitting there in 28 degrees, I'm far more comfortable. And the relative humidity is also much more appropriate in a living tree than it is in a dead tree. So retaining, as Ben was just saying, these living trees is going to be a far greater asset to the wildlife we have than retaining dead trees. Now, having said that, dead trees have a really important place and we're going to look at that a little more later on. But I want you to start to look at these trees that are potentially a risk to people and property as being a real asset to wildlife. So we need to start to change our mindset. If you've got an asset in the landscape, then it's really important to maintain that asset. Once you get a liability, how do you turn it into an asset? And I think if you, and for a lot of people, risk management's a big thing. And if you talk in terms of assets and liabilities, it's a, it's a language that they understand and that they can deal with. So put this tree into a, into a much higher use park, well, it's t starting to be a liability. How do we change the situation so that it's an asset? And from a habitat point of view, this is definitely an asset. But from a risk point of view, there's definitely some liability issues there. So trying to change the balance so that the whole thing is an asset rather than a 50-50 split. Look, um, obviously, to manage risk, there have been cuts through here. Um, there have been natural hollows formed down through here, uh, both in the dead branches at the top, but also living natural, not tight hollows. Um, and this hollow here, absolutely beautiful. It certainly has been used. I don't know whether it's active at the moment, but that's the size that most of our common small parrots, so Adelaide rosellas, eastern rosellas, rainbow lorikeets, are going to use. You might also get things like musk lorikeets um, using them as well. Uh, certainly small brush-tailed possums or ring-tailed possums are going to be using that. Uh, but we're going from really quite small hollows, and I'm struggling to see a, a tiny one, but literally bats can use something. And we have eight species of microbat here in Adelaide. You add another four when we go up onto the hills. Um, they will use something literally that's an entrance the size of my thumb. Um, an exposed section of heartwood, um, and there are fissures and cracks going through the wood. Um, bats will certainly use that. Um, if it's a tree with lots of bark, they will get in under that as well. As a zoologist, we have real problems. Uh, one of the state's ex or the one of Australia's experts, Terry Reardon, works at the museum, and he has tried to find bats in trees in the parklands and really struggled. And typically, they're found by accident. And you guys are working. Um, out in an environment where you're going to find them on a regular basis. So a really good thing to come out of this as well would be information coming back from what you're finding so we get a better data bank as scientists to understand exactly how some of these species, which are difficult to find if you're looking for them, but often are found by accident, what they're utilising, why they're utilising, how they're utilising it.